Good morning. Good morning. I'm sure you're not who you expected to see in your pulpit this morning. I offered to fill in for David, for your pastor, while he was away. Yeah, um, with his father's death, he needed the time to be with his family. And he called me on Friday, and I said, sure, I can take a ride out to Sturbridge. Not a problem. Yeah, can't hear it so well. Can't hear it so well? We're trying. Let's see if we got this right. Is that better? Let's see if we can get this right. Is that a little better? A little. Where's our guy back there? I'll, I'll speak as loud as I can. How's that? Let us uh, gather our thoughts, our prayers, and our minds to worship the Lord our God this morning. We are gathered as people of God to offer praise and thanksgiving to God, to confess our sins, to pray for the world, and to rededicate ourselves to God's, as God's servants. Let us join together in worship of God, to whom belongs blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might forever and ever. Amen. Now, where have you seen God this week? Now he calls them, what did you tell me they were called? The light of God's moment. Somebody else used another word a little while ago, but I call them God sightings. And I look for those all the week. And I know this week for me, I saw one yesterday when we moved my mother to a new assisted living facility and to see her feeling very comfortable and all, seeing her already engaging with the community for us was a God sighting. It was God in that. And one of the things when we were packing her up, the one thing she really wanted to have with her as she moved to this new facility, she had to know where her Bible was so that she could read it every evening as she always had before. She didn't want to lose sight of that. So that's my God sighting for the week. Do we have some others that we want to share? Anything else? Because God is there even when you don't think too much about it. He is there with you in those little moments. You know, everybody keeps saying God's not in our world today, but God truly is. He will be there when you see the face of your grandchild, when you see your child succeed at something, when you see your spouse content, lying in a hammock in the backyard. You go, yes, God, thank you for bringing him rest. So think about it this coming week. Where will you see God? Where will God peek in on your life? You want to do the announcements now? Okay. What? I'm set. Can you hear me now? Uh, in a few weeks, we begin the pumpkin patch. I'm three inches away. Okay. Uh, pumpkin Patch is coming along. Uh, it will be here September 23rd. And we're hoping everybody could come out, even if you just stand there and wave to people. That would be fine. If you're not able to lift pumpkins, that's fine. We hope to have the scouts and other people to help out. But everybody should be on deck. It, it is a fun day. Uh, there is a sign up in the hallway uh, going out by the office. If you could give an hour to help out during the uh, pumpkin patch sales, uh, it begins right away on Saturday the 23rd. 
Sunday the 24th. So think about giving a, a, an hour of your time. If you can give more, that would be great too. Uh, does anyone else have other announcements to make at this point? Uh, yes, Dolores Clausen. Hold on, there's a, a microphone. No, he'll give you a microphone. Welcome, Dolores. I thought I spoke loudly enough, but I want to take this moment to um, express my joy in celebrating my husband's birthday today, along with our twin grandsons, whose birthday is also today. Very nice. Thank you. Okay, anybody else? Okay, uh, let us proceed to the worship. Okay, would you all rise and follow me? Let us sing to the Lord a new song. Praise the Lord. Praise his name with dancing and music making. Praise the Lord. The Lord takes pleasure in his people and we find great joy in his glory. Praise the Lord. Please open your hymnals to page 286. It says 28, it's really 286. This is the day. Please be seated. Please read along with me. Merciful Lord, sometimes my memories get the best of me. I hold tightly to words and actions that hurt and offend. It is difficult for me to let go and allow you to heal me in the deepest parts of my soul. Forgive me, Lord for not trusting that you do take pleasure in me and desire wholeness in all who follow you. I need your strength to loosen the grip of my hurts and inner torments. Lord, replace them with your healing. Help me to feel your presence. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
I'm going to be reading a different scripture than that is, that is listed in your bulletin because that is the scripture that David had, is, was going to be preaching from and I am preaching from a different scripture. This comes from Ezekiel 17, verses 22 to 24. And I'm reading from the New International Version. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. I myself will take a shoot from the very top of a cedar and plant it. I will break off a tender sprig from its topmost shoots and plant it on a high and lofty mountain. On the mountain heights of Israel, I will plant it. It will produce branches and bear fruit and become a splendid cedar. Birds of every kind will nest in it and they will find shelter in the shade of its branches. All of the trees of the field will know that I, the Lord, bring down the tall tree and make the low tree grow tall. I will dry up the green tree and make the dry tree flourish. I, the Lord, have spoken and I will do it. May the Lord add his blessing and understanding to the reading of his holy word this morning. Lately, I've had a quote from Martin Luther King Jr. running through my head. And it reads, the judgment of God is upon the church as never before. If today's church does not recapture the sacrificial spirit of the early church, it will lose its authenticity, forfeit the loyalty of millions, and be dismissed as an irrelevant social club with no meaning for the 20th century. This passage was written in the 20th century back in 1962. But the same thing could have been written last week. And I honestly believe this is why many of our churches are in decline. We have lost our authenticity. We have become what I call pot-bound. Our roots have become so tightly packed that we can no longer thrive the way we have. In the past few years, I have seen so many churches become so pot-bound that they have withered up and died. The age and the fatigue of the congregation, the lack of direction, the unwillingness of them to allow themselves to have their roots trimmed away or to be put in a new container are all signs that a church is pot-bound. So let's look at the repotting process and see how apt the comparison is. At the same time, think about where in your life you have become pot-bound. First of all, nobody likes to spend time repotting plants. It's a chore that's often neglected. It's a lot of work, a lot of messy work. You have to get out the trowel and new soil and spread the newspapers out on a table or take the whole mess outside to work on. Sometimes it means a trip to the store to plant, to plant food for a new pot. It's one of those nuisance chores that never seems to get done until it's almost too late. Now compare that to a church. It's difficult for a church to repot itself. It's no fun to spend the time looking at programs, looking at how we've always done things, pondering why do we do things the way we do. It can be a painful task for a church to look inwardly at their roots and realize that the roots have taken the over the church, almost to the point of strangling it out of existence. The method has become more important than the message. The Bible speaks of self-examination in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. It says, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourself. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you unless, of course, you fail the test? We all have bad habits we pick up over the years, people and churches. And if things have been done a certain way because that's the way it's always been done, 
then you're well on your way to being pot bound. How many of us know things like, please don't move that chair. That chair has to stay there. That was a gift of my great grandmother. It has to stay right there. No, we open the church door at 15 minutes before service. No later, no earlier, because that's the way we've always done it. We've seen things, I see things like that in churches across the state, across our region. I had one church say, we're using the same bulletin, we use the same order of worship we used in 1938. We haven't changed a thing, and they're proud of it. I always remember when I had a church, I told my church, if we are worshiping the same way in five years that we are now, something is very wrong. We need to be in step with the times and find out what is really touching our people's lives. What is the best way to worship God? And that will change as our congregation changes. Traditions, practices, and methods can draw, crowd out any chance for new growth. For a church, this repotting process is a time of what seems to be that thing we always love, endless meetings. Reviewing bylaws, reviewing worship. For an individual, it may be taking a personal inventory. For a church, it's coming up with a new plan and a new way of being church. And all of this is hard work. Work that at first does not even show but it is work that has to get done, or we remain pot-bound. And just as all plants outgrow their containers and become pot-bound, all churches outgrow their structures, their traditions, and their way of being church. I know of a church that their bylaws said they needed 96 people, 96 positions in their bylaws to be filled. On Sunday morning, they had 20 in worship. Something's got to give. Something's got to change. But, you know, oh, no, this is the way we've always done it. We always need to need 96 people, so somebody's doing 15 jobs. That's not the way to be church. And all churches need to review and check their containers periodically. Evaluation and feedback is essential. Checking in with one another. Asking the question, the hard question. Why have people stopped coming? Self-awareness, self-evaluation, are our roots crowding out new opportunities for growth? And you know, when our pot can be so comfortable and so familiar, and our way of doing and being church is comfortable and familiar to us, we know what to expect. We know what is going to happen. But at times, I would bet that it does feel a bit dull. And I don't think that Jesus said there and said, this is how we do things. And that he did the same thing with his disciples each and every time he preached and was out. I think he really looked at where he was, who the people were, how he could connect with them. And then he tailored his message to that. Same message, but different ways of giving that message. So how do you know if your potted plants have outgrown their living space? Or rather, how do you know if your church has outgrown its way of being a church? There's a familiar verse, again, from Corinthians, this time Corinthians 1, that says, when I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put childish things away behind me. Now, we don't act the same way we did when we were 10. We don't act the same way we did when we were 25. First of all, physically, we can't do the same things now that we did when we were 25. But secondly, experience over the years has given us a new perspective in so many ways, just as the life of a church gains perspective over the years. There is this internal rite of passage we all go through when we hit our early 20s. It's kind of our first experience with self-awareness. We look at where we are in life, what we are doing, and what our classmates from high school are doing. We realize that some of our acquaintances from high school are doing the same things that they had done in high school. They've gotten no further in their education. 
still have the same dead-end jobs, still have the same excuses, our interests have changed. And we make the painful decision that some of these old acquaintances are, dra are dragging us down and are not a good influence. And we have to let them go. The same is true for a church. We have to undergo this rite of passage ritual. Look at what works and what doesn't. And the first step is to remove the plant from the pot and inspect the root system. For a church, this means removing our ministry and message from our methodology. Getting back to what the Bible tells us we should be teaching, there is very little in the New Testament about how we should worship, how we should structure our corporate church life. Since Christ had been that perfect sacrifice, there was no further need for any type of sacrificial worship. We no longer slaughter animals on our altar. In the New Testament, we only get the basic elements of worship. It has to involve teaching, exhor exhortation, singing, praising, prophesizing, reading letters, and the breaking of bread. That's it. It doesn't say you've got to do this hymn and then you've got to do the glory pop tree and you've got to sing this, that hymn. No. Those are traditions that have come over the years. And as I was saying earlier, as I was going through the bulletin this morning before worship, it changes so much from church to church. Each one finds their own way to worship God. And I think God leaves that in our hands because he knows we're such a complex people and we're so diverse that what brings meaning to one congregation may not bring meaning to another. Now, it should be fairly easy to separate our ministry from our method. They should slide easily out of the pot. The root, roots shouldn't be so wrapped around the pot that you need to slam the pot against the table or even use a mallet to remove it, the plant. Be gentle. Tradition is not a bad thing. Tradition brings us comfort. That familiarity helps center us. But notice the words. Tradition is all about us and our needs. Tradition is not about bringing someone new to the Christian faith. Even the Bible gives us a caution about tradition, which is very apt in this situation. It says, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. Let's make sure that our human tradition is not overtaking the message of Jesus Christ's teaching. Our message of God's grace, our message of eternal life is outstanding. It's unsurpassed. Our plant is fine. It's still healthy. We just need a new container a new way of doing and being church. But be gentle in this process. Don't just jerk the plant out of the pot. Slowly, with love, remove the plants. Directions for repotting say that watering several hours prior to will help you remove the plant more easily. Before we take time to separate our method from our message, Water the message with prayer and with God's blessing. Always God first. The directions state that the next step in repotting the plant is that once the plant is free from the pot, check for large, older, circular roots that can strangle the plant and prevent much needed nourishment. Look at the ministry and the message separate from the church. What does it look like? Can it hold its own? Are the leaves still green? Is God's message still there in full bloom? Or has the message somehow begun to wither away? Upon closer examination, if the plant has become so pot bound that the container itself has cracked, it means God's message is trying to break free from our efforts to contain it by our methods. This is a time to truly pay attention. Find out what roots or traditions have become so deeply entrenched 
that it's next to impossible to move them. And then you have to take, this is one of the toughest things to do, sever or remove those old roots to allow new feeder roots to establish. In order for any plant to grow, it needs pruning. It needs a clipping away of dead material. In other words, stop doing things that aren't working anymore. We may have always had a particular supper on a certain Saturday night, on a certain month. And all of a sudden we're saying, well, why isn't anybody showing up anymore? Why doesn't anybody come? Maybe it's time to clip that root away and find another way of bringing people in, meeting out in the community. Once you remove the old roots, new feeder roots will establish, new ways of being church will start, and they'll flourish. Remove the old roots, but don't destroy all of them. The directions are clear that some of the old roots must remain in order for the plant to live. We cannot do away with the entire structure or the traditions of our church. Just those that are clogging us, that are holding us back so much that we can't see in new and exciting directions. After the plant is refilled, fill in the sides, you know, the sides of the plant with new potting soil. After we have reviewed and reworked our programs and our ministry and our structure, we need to add new soil around the roots. And that gives us new fertile ground to surround our traditions. It gives us new possibilities. Now, most plants should be repotted annually, but vigorous growing plants may need to be repotted more often. Once we replant our message and our ministry, we need to continue to nurture them. Water that plant. We all have roots, and in order for them not to become pot-bound and grow, we need two things. First, the atmosphere, sunlight, the soil, the climate, the temperature. And then, secondly, I should say, the soil, the nutrients, and the water on which the roots feed as they grow. Now, new sprouts will begin to appear at the top of the plant. New growth will stretch towards sunlight, and it's a beautiful thing. So now, once we've repotted our ministry or our message, we'll sit here and go, well, who's going to see this? We've now replotted. We've now kind of redone our, re our structure. Who's going to see it? Where are we going to place that plant so everybody can see it? If we leave the plant inside the building, no one's going to see it other than us. If we plant it outside, rather than try to contain it within these four walls, then it will have the opportunity to spread, to grow, not become pop bound again. Everyone can then see the beauty of our message. Still a lot of people are going to think that our plant is ugly. A lot of people are even going to question why we bothered. I like to tell this story because for me it's been a constant reminder all these years. When I was in seminary, my daughter was in high school, and she would come home after school and bring her friends with her. And I remember one of the boys came and he looked at me and he goes, what are you doing? I said, I'm studying. I'm actually studying Christology. And he goes, well, what the heck is Christology? I said, it's the story of Jesus' teachings how they affect us and everything. And he goes, he looks at me, he goes, you mean to tell me this Jesus guy was real? Had no idea. If we keep our message inside this building, he's going to believe that all his life. If he doesn't see this church outside the walls of this church, he may have a chance to be touched by something that we do outside the walls of this church. In general, Christianity suffers from a huge public relations problem. Gandhi said, I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. And that's the general view of the world today. Dan Kimball writes in his book, The Emerging Church, that if someone looked at Christianity only from the media, they would grow up learning that all faiths are equal, but that Christianity is principally a negative religion, known for finger-pointing 
and condemning the behavior of others. It's more of a stinkweed at times than the lovely plant that we know that it is. And I cringe when I see reporting about Christianity in the media. The things that are being done in the name of Christianity are so unchristian. I was reading a Christian Century magazine this week, and there was a short blurb entitled Seventh Heaven. And it says, in order to serve satellite congregations, megachurches in Texas have purchased helicopters and installed heliports so their pastors can move quickly from one site to the next. Now, the cost of a used helicopter is $500,000, and a new one is $2 million. And that doesn't include the pilot, the insurance, the maintenance. Can you imagine how much ministry could be done with half a million dollars? Can you imagine what you could do? The people whose lives you could touch, the homeless, the hungry, what you could do with half a million, with up to two million dollars. I wonder how they justify it. I just do, I have a real problem. But then I'm not a fan of mega churches anyway. To me, this is church. I love this. In the book of Judges, it says, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord or what he had done for Israel. And as I, I demonstrated earlier when I, with my story, we're looking at a, dem, a generation that not only doesn't know the Lord, but sees no reason to. Based on what they see in the media, who can blame them? There are many more options. Christianity is not seen as the only way. It has been said that while we remain a nation decisively shaped by religious faith, our politics and our culture are in main lessly, less influenced by movements and arguments, arguments of an explicitly Christian character than they were even five years ago. And I've been doing a lot of reading in church history because that's Baptist history in Massachusetts, particularly because I've been working with the archives up at Tabcom. And I find that the difference, you'd see an article, a huge article in the paper when a new pastor came to town or when there was an association meeting or when somebody was ordained. And then I find as I go reading through the decades, when you get up into the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, we'll say things like, There'll be a funeral at this church on Saturday. There's a wedding at this church on Friday. That's the only time you see the name of the church in the media at all. Something to think about. There are a lot of gardens out there for people to look at, lots of them. And our plants have to be beautiful. Nobody wants to see plants that are strangling one another. In other words, stop the conflict and the arguing. That'll turn people off and they'll run in the other direction. Stop it. It doesn't help anybody. It destroys your church. People are looking for a spiritual garden. And I think Christianity is the best garden that we should be planting in. But we need to get out there and offer the plants to people and not just sit here and say, we have a wonderful church, come visit us. We're here, come see us. We need to go out and offer these plants to people. Give them an alternative. Show them the beauty of the Christian faith in action. We need to have a plant sale of sorts, giving the plants away. See where they will take root. It's time to get out the pruning shears. We may need a little pruning here or there, but we're still blossoming, and the plant is still green. But we need to put our plants outside in the sunlight. We need to make sure that everyone can see our plants, sees our message. We need to find those tender shoots of our plant. We need to pluck them and replant them on the highest mountaintop where everyone can see them. Then, and only then, will we bear fruit. Then, and only then, will the birds come and sit in our branches. Because God will have spoken, and we will have done his will. Amen.
<laughs> One of the joys a congregation has, and I really consider it a joy, is to give back to God one small portion of what he has given to us. We have the privilege of sharing with God. We're invited this morning to, as we leave, or at any time, to go back and put your offering in the offertory box. Or you can use PayPal and pay it online. The PayPal link is on the website. Or you can mail it. Yeah, you can go do that. We can, you can mail it to the church. But please continue to support the church, support God's work in this world. Before our offering, we will sing hymn number 354, Seek Ye First. shall be added unto you. Alleluia, alleluia. Ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. Alleluia, alleluia. mystery in oceans deep my faith will stand tall and I will call upon your name and keep my eyes above the waves where oceans rise my soul will rest in your embrace for I am yours and you are mine your grace abounds in deepest waters your sovereign hand will be my guide where feet may fail and fear surrounds me you never failed and you won't start now And I will call upon your name And keep my eyes above the waves When oceans rise, my soul will rest in your embrace For I am yours and you are mine without borders let me walk upon the waters wherever you will 
would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. My faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Let us pray. Great, holy, and just Lord, you bless us so richly. Help us to better see your gifts, be they great or small, and grow in us a desire to pass on each gift, that like loaves and fishes our baskets might overflow. May these offering plates be a sign of what you are doing in us. Bless them and bless us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Oh. When I drive around in my car, I love to listen to music. And lately, and I like country music. I just really do. There's one song that has been coming on lately, and the first line of the song caught my attention. And I was kind of like, what? But it was so true. And it begins with the words, I only talk to God when I want a favor. And I've thought a lot about that line. And wondering, how often do when we pray, do we want to pray a prayer of thanksgiving to God for all that God has brought into our lives. So as we enter into this time of prayer, let us not only remember our joys and our concerns, which is good to lift up to the Lord God, but think of some way that we, some prayer that we can give to say thank you to God for something that God has done for us lately. So do we have any special joys or concerns this morning that need uplifting to the Lord our God? Yes. Good morning, everyone. I am wearing wrist braces because I fell on, in a street in, uh, in Denver. I wasn't looking and poof, down. And uh, it, it was hurtful. And I was very grateful that they, my son took me straight to urgent care. Now, 20 years ago, we didn't have a place like urgent care. Uh, they took me in, they, they tested me, and no, I didn't break my wrist, and, he, and they patched up all of this that was here, but that's all better now. And I'm grateful that we live in this country, and we have the support of places like urgent care, hospitals, emergency rooms. Um, 50 years ago, you were on your own if something like that happened. So I'm very grateful to live today and people are uh, helpful. Even the people around me at that point were very helpful. So thank you very much and I'm on the mend. Thank you. This morning we need to pray for Pastor David as he goes to be with his family as they help with his father's transition to an eternal life. Also, I don't know if you know, Thursday is a very big day for your pastor. It is probably the end of his ordination process when he will meet with officials with the committee on, from the state called the Ministerial Preparation Committee to see if he is ready to be ordained. And if all goes well, which I see no reason why it shouldn't, 
He will go on to his ordination council and then be ready to be ordained in a very short time. It's been a long haul for him, so we should continue to pray this week for him as he goes through this. Do we have anything else? Okay, then. Why don't we bow our heads in prayer? O oh God of light, we have heard your message proclaimed from all times that in you there is no dark cloud at all. Nothing exists that can hide the light of your presence. Forgive us when we cling to the shadows, failing to heed your call to wake up and join the work of your reign. Send us to do your deeds of mercy and peace to feed the hungry, shelter the homeless, touch the sick with your healing balm, console the sorrowing, visit the prisoners, welcome the stranger. Guide us in this time of shadows. Keep us from despair when we see that there is no peace in our cities and no security in our places of higher learning. Lift our eyes towards you, that we may see your face shining on us and walk in your light. Comfort those who are living in the shadow of grief, shattered by the loss of children, parents, spouses, friends, and colleagues. Grace them with your presence, Lord. <coughs> Give assurance to all who are missing loved ones that with the living and the dead are in your care, certain to be joined again in that unbroken circle that will sing your praise forever. This morning, Lord, we pray that we have the joy of quality medical care that is available to all, that we can get the care that we need so easily. Lord God, we are grateful for all those that serve in the medical field, from the staff, the nurses, the doctors, Lord God. We know that they are the embodiment of your presence here on earth. Give them a calm touch, a soothing voice, and the ability to touch people through you with your love in their times of need. We pray for Pastor Dave as he is with his family, as they mourn the loss of his father. We pray for him this week as he continues on his ordination process, getting so close to the end, Lord. Be with him, shine down on him, and bless him as he goes through this process. We pray for the people of Morocco for the earthquake that has struck there just the other day, for the thousands that are now dead. Lord God, help us to find ways that we can help. Help us to pray constantly for those people. Make your presence known to them. Help them to find comfort in your presence. Lord God, it is good to be able to come into your house and have this time to put aside the cares of life and the busyness of living. We're hurrying about planning, preparing, fixing, and organizing, and worrying about how everything is going to turn out. Even while we're here in church, those thoughts tend to drown out your voice and what you want to say to us. We do want to hear from you because we need to know again and anew today that you are there and that you know us and where we are in our walk with you. There are many among us today with special needs, with very special prayers that are so close to our hearts that we cannot put them into words. Whether it is fear, whether it is just not even knowing what those needs are. Lord God, you know what those needs are. Please comfort us with your presence. 
Help us to know that, there is, that even though you don't say it, that you know what it is. We pray for our church. We pray as we gather each Sunday. We pray to continue to see God's plan here for us in Sturbridge. We thank you, Lord, for all you bring to us, all the love and joy that we find here and we find with our friends and family. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Incline thine ear to us and grant us thy peace. Amen. Now, if we could stand and sing our closing hymn, Immortal Invisible, hymn number 66. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Jesus Christ that together you may be one voice, in one voice, glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. and the peace of God be with you this day. Go in peace and the peace of God be with you always. Celebrate and share the joy. Celebrate new life. Go in peace and the peace of God be with you always.